Let's talk to the director of the Geneva Center for African Security and Strategic Studies, David Otto, joins us from London. Morning to you, David. Thank you for your time. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Good morning. The, the Russian president is going uh, outside of Russia for the first time in about four, four and a half months. Is this a, is this a sign that he's becoming more and more confident that uh, he's got things under control, both within Russia and in uh, the situation with Ukraine? Over the weekend, his forces seized Severodonetsk, and this morning we're hearing reports that Several other towns on the way to Lishishank have also uh, fallen to the Russians. So possibly it's just a question of time before they control virtually the Donbas region. Effectively so. Um, like you said, uh, since the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, uh, the, the president has not, been, has not stepped out of uh, the country. And, uh, you know, this is very indicative of the fact that uh, there is some level of... Uh, strategic comfort um, in, in that, you know, there is some battlefield progress being made. Um, now, I don't know if that is going to, um, uh, you know, lead to a complete victory at, at the end. Uh, but I think, you know, the Russian president is, is much more comfortable uh, with, with the position uh, which, in which um, they are, you know, from a, an operational perspective. I, I mean, as you rightly mentioned, uh, the entire Serrano Donetsk, you know, is now falling. Uh, to, to the Russians. And of course, effectively, that means that Luhansk um, is now under the full control of uh, Russian troops. Um, so th that is a milestone, you know, uh, in the eastern, um, you know, a chase over the, the, the entire region. So perhaps, you know, we would see uh, some kind of a, uh, a focus now on, on Donetsk itself, you know, uh, so that, you know, uh, the Russians can then uh, perhaps, you know, finally claim the entire Donbass um, industrial heartland. Um, of course, I, I know that, you know, there will still be a lot of resistance. You've seen the European Union, uh, the, the G7, uh, talking about, uh, uh, you know, giving more assistance to, to the Ukrainians. But, you know, um, in, in, in the grand scale of things, I don't think um, more heavy weapons, you know, will make any difference. Because, again, effectively, uh, this is still... Um, significantly, uh, a battle that has been fought entirely within the Ukrainian territory. Um, so the destruction still comes down to the Ukrainian territory. So, you know, Russia is, you know, is, is, is somehow still in front, um, you know, uh, despite um, all the analysts um, saying otherwise. Um, it's a comfort, you know, for Putin, I would say. Do you think, uh, my last guest just before you came on, uh, talked about the fact that uh, Ukraine is kind of uh, hamstrung in this because all the help it is getting is defensive. Uh, most of the weapons, virtually all the weapons that it has received, all the help militarily that it has received is to defend itself. It cannot go on the offensive. And that's because at the start of the war, uh, the Russians may declare that anyone who supplies Ukraine with offensive weapons will also be a target of, uh, of a Russian attack. So the EU, the G7, uh, NATO are not quite willing to uh, step into the crosshairs. And therefore, at the end of the day, when all is uh, put down, beyond all the propaganda on both sides and so on, the hard fact is that Ukraine is fighting um, with, its, with one hand tied behind its back. I think they're actually fighting with two hands, you know, tied behind their backs, you know, because, of course, um, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, effectively, Ukraine is fighting in Ukraine. Um, so no matter how defensive or offensive you are, uh, you're still in a, in a much more defensive position because uh, you're, you're not, um, you know, taking the war or, the, you know, the battle to the enemy. You're still taking the battle within your own territory. Um, so, um, you know, in, in other words, uh, even if Ukraine were to be given offensive weapons, uh, which, you know, I believe that they are being given offensive weapons, but not officially, um, you know, uh, it, it, will make, it wouldn't make that much of a difference. I mean, Russia is a superpower. I mean, they've got, um, you know, enormous firepower, even if uh, the entire European Union were to pour its, um, uh, its military, uh, you know, within Ukraine, as long as it still goes to... Uh, you know, um, the Ukrainians themselves using these weapons um, rather than having troops on ground from other European states helping Ukraine, officially, of course, 
um, then I still don't see uh, that much of a difference. You know, I, I think what we would say is Russia being slowed down um, on the insurgency side of the battle, which is the horizontal war, where uh, you know uh, the Ukrainians will set up ambushes and all that. But uh, with the overwhelming force and the fact that Russia is not fighting in its own territory, it makes the battle and the war very easy for them. Um, so, um, to be honest, I think um, you know Ukraine, you know, will struggle irrespective of how much um, assistance is being given, irrespective of the sanctions that um, have been uh, le le leveled against Russia. We are not seeing any difference. All we're saying, as, as of now, is that Russia is seizing more territories. Uh, there is also the fact that it, it does appear as if the situation is kind of expanding. Uh, right from the start of this war, we knew that Belarus uh, was an ally of uh, uh, Russia. Its, its territory has been used uh, to stage incursions into Ukraine. It has provided uh, quite a bit of help uh, to Russia. But now uh, we're hearing that the Russians... Uh, the Russian president has promised the Belarusian president that uh, they're going to hand over Iskander missiles, uh, which are nuclear capable uh, uh, to Belarus, to fight off Lithuania and Poland, which uh, Belarus says uh, are making aggressive uh, intentions known towards it. Uh, it. This looks like the theater of conflict might be expanding beyond Ukraine. My enemy's enemy is my friend. I, I mean, uh... Uh, what the Russians are looking at doing here is to ensure that um, um, you know they you know they, they safeguard the interests of the allies you know against the enemies of the allies. Um, if Belarus you know were to um, continue to give its assistance to to Russia, then of course um, Russia must also ensure that it has the capabilities um, that it requires you know to fend against um, any neighboring states. And effectively, that's what um, you know Putin is doing. I mean, um, uh, th th there is nothing worse than a, a Russia that has no uh, no friends. Uh, and you know, of course, we've seen that uh, Belarus has been very overt uh, in the way that you know it, it has been assisting uh, you know Russia during this um, very um, invasion with uh, Ukraine. So um, you know, th that is what any country would do. That's what Russia would do, because of course it does want again, as I mentioned earlier on. Uh, to, to make sure that um, it safeguards the uh, support uh, that it has. You know, very few countries are willing uh, due to the, uh, the very impact of, um, you know, what the European Union, the US, the UK would say to assist Russia overtly. Um, so um, it's, it's down to Russia, and I think, you know, Russia is just doing the strategic thing uh, to and ensure now, that, it, you know... You are an expert yeah. in all of you are an expert in all of this, so I, ha I have to ask you this uh, before I let you go. Uh, President Putin is going to Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. Uh, there are many people who can possibly not find those two countries on a map, uh, uh, and probably in many instances may not have even heard of those two countries. And then subsequently, he's going to meet the Indonesian leader in Moscow. Do you think there's a strategy, particularly to the two places he's going? Uh, to visit. Is there a strategy uh, that you could possibly think of in his mind? I think the immediate strategy is um, uh, Putin is looking for friends. Uh, he's, he's looking for more allies, um, you know, um, and, and that's the only strategic reason why uh, at this time when Russia is uh, under, um, you know, uh, the, you know uh, sanctions and everything from the European Union and the U.S., um, you know, Russia will be looking towards, you know, getting more allies uh, from the countries that you've named. Uh, perhaps, you know, because these countries, of, of course, uh, uh, they, they've been a, a victim of uh, uh, the neighboring Afghanistan crisis. You know, they haven't been, uh, you know, in very excellent uh, relations with the West. And, and so what you look for is you, um, you pick out those nations um, that uh, don't have the best, you know, uh, some kind of diplomatic relations with the West, um, and then you then bring them on your side. So for Putin, I think the first step for him is to expand uh, his friends, you know, and to perhaps, you know, you know persuade those other countries that are in the middle uh, to join and support, you know, its, um, uh, its invasion in Ukraine. Even if it means, you know, them remaining neutral, that's a win-win for, for Putin. So um, at this point in time, what Putin is looking for 
It's very simple. It's looking for friends. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, uh, for your perspective, as usual, of course. Uh, we'll be coming back to you from time to time uh, for uh, your perspective on all these uh, developments. But for now, thank you and have a pleasant day ahead of you. Thank you.